With interviews from Lemmy, Terry Ollis, and Nick Turner. For the first time, the inside story. With strong language from the start. Do not panic. It's Hawkwind. like a, a bunch of loony spacemen who'd been on a spaceship for, you know, for a thousand years and had gone completely wacko. There's some very respectable rock and rollers out there that cite Hawkwind that has a major influence in them. John Lydon from the Sex Pistols, he said there would have been no Sex Pistols if it wasn't for Brainstorm. All the punk bands, they were looking to Hawkwind as a role model, really. It was like Star Trek with long hair and drugs, you know. I mostly drummed in the news. Oh, I got so hot and sweaty, I was just like a racehorse when I finished. I was literally descending into hell. Really. I mean, you imagine this six foot two bird with tits the size. I mean, if she turned around too fast, she'd kill you. I mean, we weren't the fucking Pink Floyd, man. We weren't, you know, cute. <laughs> we were like a fucking black nightmare. We used to lock the doors so people couldn't get out. <laughs> Too wild and ugly for the rock and roll mainstream, Hawkwind forged the original sound of the Westway from the back of a flatbed truck, and over the next four decades led the British underground from the squats of Ladbrook Grove to the solstice at Stonehenge and beyond, into the new dawn of rave and techno. The good it's old right, days, mate. eh? <coughs> it's all right, mate. Well, it doesn't change round here very much, does it? It wasn't in Hawkins. Oh, was he the singer? Yeah. Oh, right. This is where Dave Brock used to is, go busking. That's right. It's, yeah, I do, yeah. 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 That's it. He was doing the good thing. Hurry on Sunday. The only original member of Hawkwind in the band today is founder Dave Brock, seen here on the left in 1968. Brock's musical career began on the streets of Ladbrook Grove as a busker. His co-founder members Mick Slattery and Nick Turner have come back to retrace their steps. But he didn't do it as well as that. No. Can we do that? What about the copyright? Unfortunately, Dave Brock has declined to appear in this film due to the participation of Nick Turner. In the, corporate mask, good morning, ah. the band grew from a core of Dave Brock and Mick Slattery. Nick Turner came on board with a van and a saxophone and they soon recruited Turner's friend Dick Mick on electronics, bassist John Harrison and a 17-year-old drummer Terry Ollis. We got the um, Royal College of Art, a lecture hall in there, where we, always, we, had, we had it for the whole summer break, so we could leave all the gear set up on the stage there. Then they used to go and drop acid and go and play up there. With strobe lights. <laughs> So they just go out there and play for hours and hours, and then they went out and played gigs. We did a gig at the All Saints Hall, which was in Notting Hill Gate, and that was the first gig that the band did. We went as Group X, and it, the gig was actually being run by some people from an agency called Clearwater. Doug Smith was one of the guys involved with the management company. And in walked this bunch of reprobates, is all I can call them, because they, they certainly weren't like anybody else. They definitely stood out as travellers, and they said, Give us a go. And we just said, how? You got any equipment? It's too late. Can you set up? The agreement was they would use high tides equipment. Well, I first saw them on their very first gig, All Saints Hall with High Tide. That's the band I was playing with at the time. They were one of the first bands to use a strobe or to, or to use any kind of lighting effects, really, in those days. I was a bit tripping that night. And that particular night, John Peel would come. And he walked out and he sort of grabbed me by the arm and said, get them. 
they sound as if they're going to do something. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And that's really where Hawkins came together, you know. But we never really got the name for some time later, really. I think the name of Hawkwind came from a mixture of um, partly to do with Michael Moorcock's influence. We all read his books. Part of it was also a habit of um, farting and spitting. Nick was always scraping his throat and hawking and doing these really elongated musical farts. No sooner had Hawkwind signed a record deal then they lost their first member, Mick Slattery, who went to live in a gypsy caravan in Ireland. In the band's tug of war between fellowship and sole ownership, he was the first of almost 50 musicians to pass through Hawkwind over the last 37 years. Slattery was replaced by Hugh Lloyd Langton, and soon afterwards, the band went into the studio to record their first single. Because there was a cult following that had built up by that point, they sold records at Southern Bank. Oh, this, this looks interesting. Maybe we'll make an album. For the first album, I think, had this captured the spirit of the band the most. For at the time, just played live in the studio, pretty much the first album. The music scene of the time was heavily influenced by what was going on in the hippie movement in America. But instead of the flower power of San Francisco, Hawkwind grew out of the urban sounds of Ladbroke Grove. I think the Ladbroke Grove scene and, and around that area was rather like Greenwich Village, I suppose. There was a lot of very creative people there. It was quite exciting, really. At one party, I remember introducing Arthur Clarke to William Burroughs, which everybody thought would be impossible. You know, there was Clarke, the scientific chap, and Burroughs, the, the beat. And they got on like a house on fire. They would not, you know, they just kind of stayed together the whole, the whole evening talking. I've never been in an environment, certainly in England or Great Britain even, where music so defined the environment and uh, very different and eclectic kinds of music. It was really great, you know, it was really fantastic. Drugs were very important, especially around Portobello. There was always lots of good marijuana, good hashish. Hash cooker, man, 16 traditional recipes, two shillings. Lots of great acid as well. But of course there was speed and a few other dodgy things that didn't do so well for people. And it was that period, it was, you know, it was, it was at the crossroads between the 60s and the 70s. The 70s hadn't really defined themselves yet, it was still early days. And in the middle of this were people like Hawkwind, living on soulful and spiritual endeavour, basically. And I think that's what they wanted to do with their music. It was in Ladbroke Grove that the band first teamed up with Michael Moorcock, leading light of a new wave of science fiction writers. I was helping organize some gigs under the motorway. I'd already written some lyrics for Dave and Nick. They'd asked me for some lyrics. During the organizing of that particular gig, um, they said, why don't you come up on stage and perform them for us? So I did Sonic Attack and, a, you know, things of that kind. Sonic Attack on your district, follow these rules. If you are making love, it is imperative to bring all bodies to orgasm simultaneously. Do not waste time blocking your ears. Do not waste time seeking a soundproof shelter. Try to get as far away from the sonic source as possible. It's dystopian in that you're always issuing warnings, and that's what dystopia is about. But, it, but I mean, you tend to issue the warnings because you're, you're optimistic enough to think that by issuing the warning, something will change. You know, a lot of those lyrics, which were virtually psychotic in the world they were showing, were only being done in order to try to, to change things. The people 
that use something must be part of it. That is what participatory democracy is. This so, is the acid <laughs> test. This is the only way to tell whether a person is in the alternative society or not. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah. Right. 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 Go ahead. Right. right. Burn the money. Right. You burn the money. That was the time. That was the zeitgeist. We really did think we could change things for the better. We certainly didn't think they would get as bad as they did get. Shops are free, houses are free, we don't need money, that's where it's at, that's what it's all about! Ladbroke Grove was home to the radical press, and one of the great gathering points for the underground communities was at the offices of Friends. Well, Friends magazine was a broadsheet journal, and it came out every two weeks, I think. It was like Oz. I mean, it was like uh, the International Times was the other one. Whatever was happening in the counterculture, there'd be a bit of politics, there'd be a bit of... The, anyone that had a, an axe to grind against the man <laughs> would, uh, could, could come in there and, you know, vent their spleen, basically. Hawkwind used Friends' office as a meeting place for when they did gigs, which was almost every day. So every day they would be in the office. The whole group, they'd come in one at a time. The, the room would immediately start resembling a, a Cheech and Chong movie. I mean, it was just smoke everywhere. They were the best times in that office were when they were there. They were kind of like the Pied Pipers, you know. I mean, they, okay, you know, it's the end of the underground, but here's Hawkwind, they, they're coming in and like, you know, we'll, we'll go off to a gig with them. And, uh, will still keep the spirit high. In the emerging corporate rock culture, the idealism of the 60s was becoming the hard currency of the 70s. But Hawkwind cast themselves as a people's band. We were at the other end of the music business. We were the alternative end. We did gigs whether they were free or were paid for because the bands needed exposure. That was the whole philosophy of it. And in a funny sort of way, uh, sort of the key people at the time were doing that as well. I mean, it's where John Lennon was, and it was Labrador Grove for John Lennon as opposed to Chelsea, which was once you made it and made some money, you moved down to Chelsea. <laughs> as leaders of the Ladbrook Grove scene, Hawkwind had established a cult following in London and beyond. They became the, um, the ambassadors of that whole Ladbroke Grove counterculture. They would go out into the provinces and play their, their kind of stoner rock. In each provincial town, there'd be three or four people who had some kind of access to, to cannabis, or maybe a bit of LSD, or maybe some form of speed. When Hawkwind played, you'd see those four people right in front of the stage with a look of complete beauty, you know, just home at last, you know, he'd <laughs> look on their face. No one really thought about tomorrow, and no one in the band made much money, but then no one really cared. I've never met a group who had such little regard for money. They were the last group in the world to have any kind of fame-seeking agenda. If it was a choice between playing a free gig and a paying gig, very often Hawkman would have played the free gig. Dave was very agreeable to doing, to doing free gigs. Yeah, I think it depended partly on the individual politics of the people involved. If they approached me, I'd always say yes. <laughs> I used to do loads, you know, Friends of the Earth, anybody really. Gay pride or, you know, anybody really. The ethos of the underground was free. The White Panthers supplied food at all the festivals for free. The band was very associated with the White Panthers in many ways. There was no sort of radicalness from the point of uh, them doing blowing up buildings or anything like that. The spirit of the free gigs under the Westway soon headed into the country with the rise of the free festival scene. The rural effect, which generally free festivals tended to be, um, had a very different effect on the music. Uh, it tended to be more extended because there were no time limits. Um, you would sometimes have bands playing as the sun came up. You'd have some bands playing at three o'clock in the morning. You'd have campfires. It added a very different dimension to everything that was going on. So free festivals, we play out on the stage, and the playing festivals, we sort of 
would try to do a, an outside thing, you know, free for the people like who couldn't get in and stuff. But, I mean, that's what we've done at the Isle of Wight with the big Canvas City thing. Hawkwind were part of the forces of misrule that turned the 1970 Isle of Wight Festival into a standoff between the music business and the alternative society. In Isle of Wight, I think, uh, Mick Farron and the White Panthers, along with Hawkwind, who were playing outside in the tent, marched in and sort of opened the gates and let people in. And there was this big to-do, and they had this Mexican standoff with the White Panthers and the Isle of Wight Festival. Irate, militant pop fans have stormed the fences. They believe that pop music should be free. Last night came the worst incident of all. It looks peaceful now, but they were hurling stones, bricks over the wall at the security officers and their dogs. While the Isle of Wight saw the last major performances of rock icons Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison of The Doors, Hawkwind were on the other side of the fence, literally and ideologically as they played on the festival parameter in a state-of-the-art inflatable dome dubbed Canvas City. Canvas City was amazing. I mean, the whole Isle of Wight experience was amazing, really. I remember at one point, which everyone had got spiked up. You couldn't pick up anything to drink without... There was some girl there, uh, well, she was called Sunshine, with loads of orange sunshine acid. Although people had taken it anyway, everything you picked up to try and drink had acid in it, you know. And somebody turned up with a bottle of apple juice, pure bottle, looked like pure apple juice, and passed it round. Oh, great! Something to depart from lukewarm water or something. A few glugs in this apple juice. The hallucinogenic started clicking in. Uh, somebody stopped my guitar in my hand. Right, we're on now. Hey, okay, what? <laughs> we had all the gear set up to play. And I'd just gone in there first, all the rest of the band behind me. As I was walked in, they slammed the door shut, wouldn't let anybody in or out because the machine had broken, keeping the thing up. And it was slowly coming down. You led in through up some stairs and through a door. Then you had to close that door and down steps in, into the actual auditorium. And this thing was getting lower and lower, and there were women screaming. It was really getting hairy, you know. I was being led in there, and I, I, I'd literally. I was literally descending into hell. Really. There's all these people freak dancing. It's quite a gory light show, freaky light show. So I just hit a chord and this whole cacophony kicked off. Or getting on my knees and praying, but really praying, you know, which Nick, Nick said a couple of days later, I mean, once he parted and met up again, you know what he did on stage, it looked really good, and he got down on your knees and prayed. I mean, not realising, you know, I, I, I was down on my knees really meaning it, you know. It must have affected the, the music a great deal, really, yeah. It was a very much shared experience with the audience. You know, I suppose half of them were, were on drugs anyway, you know. We all took off together, really. We all, off we went on a little space journey together. The Isle of Wight put Hawkwind on the map as music's anarchic outsiders. But Hugh's experience prompted his departure for Leo Sayer's backing band. Meanwhile, Hawkwind pushed further at the edges of sanity with the arrival of Robert Calvert. Robert's position in the band at the beginning was brought in by Nick Turner because Robert was writing. He was writing lots of ideas. They were sort of beginning to scan out. I used to live in Margate in, in the 60s. Well, I grew up there, actually. And um, he was a mate of mine from there. He'd always wanted to be um, a fighter pilot. But for some reason or other, he ended up being a poet. And then when I became involved in Hawkwind, I, invi I invited him to be involved as well because I thought he was a very creative person and he became the poet of the band. Well, he was a bit further out than most of us because he was quite mentally unstable, you know. I mean, we was all pretty far out, but he was really a bit far out on top of that, you know what I mean? But his mother reckoned that he had nervous breakdowns every 18 months. So he would go 
from being really depressed to being completely manic. Other times he'd um, be having a nervous breakdown. He'd go for a 20 mile route march, you know, in his army uniform and end up in a loony bin. He always wore these tweed suits and looked well dressed and his clothes were clean. And it wasn't, uh, he didn't fit quite into the whole situation. Calvert wrote fiction and poetry for the underground press and would later make forays into theatre and novel writing, as well as becoming one of Hawkwind's key songwriters. The only person who was giving it any kind of intellectual description was Calvert. In a sense, it was his Achilles heel. He never really wanted to be a, the great rock and roll performer that he was. He always wanted to be taken seriously as a poet. Once he got involved, the band started expanding. Its, its presentation, its ideas, the shows were full of great lighting. In Search of Space was the band's breakthrough album. It was the era of the Apollo moon landings and the spiders from Mars. Outer space was in the air and Hawkwind were ready for takeoff. Space rock had been born. The album came with Calvert and artist Barney Bubbles' Hawkwind Log, which envisioned the LP as a two-dimensional trip in space and time. Lots of Barney's ideas, you know, that were incorporated in that. He and Robert got together over the concept of this spaceship that lands on Earth and becomes two-dimensional, really off-the-wall wacky, very interesting and metaphysical and mythological and science fictional and science fantasy. And the term space rock come up when we was in clear water. And it, yeah, it pretty much summed us up really. Because we we're all really spaced out and really rocking. <laughs> it was psychedelic. It was psychedelic space as opposed to space. And to a certain extent the Barney drawings and influences and it certainly led it that direction. Hawkwind's use of heavy trance rhythms and electronics was closer to the new German bands, such as Amon Duhl, Can, and Neu, than to anything going on in Britain. I think the science fiction element comes from the sounds. If you think about it, he had this audio generator in the background, which the only other band in the world using an audio generator at the time was Silver Apples. And Dick Nick would have these wonderful sounds going across the albums, and some spacey sounds. And because that was spacey sound, it was an inevitable thing that we were going to sort of follow that path. Former roadie Dick Mick was soon to be joined by another roadie elevated to the stage, Del Detmar. Dick Mick and Del Detmar, really good company. They seemed to me to be like a couple of guys that were like, you know, pot dealers that had just fallen into music making by happenstance. It was happenstance that brought another key member to the band. I just come out of the Hendrix roadie job, you know. And then uh, I was in a squat in Gloucester Road and I met Dick Mick. One of the chicks living there picked him up in a boozer or something and brought him back and he was on his way to India. And he was going in the wrong direction anyway, he was going west, you know. <laughs> but uh, we discovered that we had a mutual interest in seeing how long the human body could be made to jump about without stopping. Yeah, he was more into um uppers and downers rather than psychedelics. I don't think he was that much into psychedelics at all, uh, which the rest of the band were large. Lemmy first joined the band at a gig at a squat in Powys Square in September 1971. I never picked up a fucking bass before I went to that show in Powys Square in my life. Never played the bass, never touched one. And they said, who plays bass? And Dick Mick said, he does. And I thought, I don't play bass, what are you talking about? And I walked on stage and Nick Turner, helpful as ever, said, make some noises in E. This is called You Shouldn't Do That. When did you first see Hawkwind before you joined them and what, what were they like? The roundhouse and they were terrifying. Like, I mean, I thought, I've got to join these guys, I can't watch them. Because there were 600 people doing this all together at the same time, you know, like epileptic fit. It was kind of heavy, and so people that were on downers could like, oh, hey, man, this is kind of heavy, you know. And people who smoked pot were like, yeah, because there's all these textures in the sound, you know. 
It wasn't like Jerry Garcia who would like would play these incredible guitar solos. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. We didn't make any attempt to understand synthesizers. We just got, I mean, Dick was on this ring modulator thing and Dell, who was playing the synthesizer, had no previous experience of it whatsoever. He just bought the booklet and sat there reading it while he was doing it. I mean, I don't know what it sounded like, but it must have been interesting from time to time when he was like turning the page, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was, it was experimental in the true sense, you know. We really were trying to find some new way of, of, of doing music some, you know, and, and using the electronics um, rather than simply using the electronics to be a kind of a, a, you know, amplification for, for acoustics. We were actually trying to use electronics for their own sake. Um, but without the kind of pretentiousness that tended to be around. We were, I, th I think I was proud that we were, we were the only people who didn't say that we were influenced by Stockhausen. We called it an audio generator. Actually, it was a ring modulator through uh, the Wawa pedal, which is kind of a weird sound, but it goes out of human hearing both ways, right? And if it goes out of human hearing upwards, then your inner ear fails and your balance goes and you fall on the floor and eventually throw up. And if you go below human hearing that way, it loosens your sphincter muscles and you shit down your legs. So we used to have a lot of fun with the audience, yeah. I had, used to have these uh, speakers I call eliminators. I had one on each side of the stage, they're huge things, big horn. Kind of devices with high frequency horns in the middle in conjunction with the VCS3 synth that I had, like a stunner badger at 20 places. Dick Mick used to come over and say, See that blonde guy? Over he go. I would never instigate uh, sonic violence to that degree, but you know, once someone else starts it, you know, I'll join in. In striking contrast to the band's arsenal of sonic weapons was the arrival of dancer Miss Stacia who climbed on stage to join the band at a gig at the Flamingo Ballroom in Red Roof. Stacia was all right, she was a petrol pump attendant. We loaded up the petrol, filled up just before a gig. Dell invited us to the gig. She came, I think she probably danced that night, slept with Dell, and three weeks later she was in the band. <laughs> it was very easy to get in our band in those days. <laughs> She was a bookbinder by profession and then she had an uncontrollable urge one night to take all the clothes off and paint herself blue. Which is probably a throwback to the Roman invasion of Britain, you think? Woad, you know. And then she came on the road with us, you know. She was she was really weird. I mean she was great, you know. Blowing bubbles on stage and shit. She was great. I mean she was an impressive woman. I mean she was six foot two. 52 inch bust, you know. I mean, she was a, an overwhelming sight for the youngsters in the crowd. And she used to pull them down again and bring them back to the hotel, you know. I shared a hotel room with her for two tours. It was really fucking funny, you know, to see these kids. Ugh. I thought it was her birthday, and in a way it was. <laughs> with the arrival of Stacia and Lemmy, alongside the likes of Robert Calvert, Barney Bubbles and the band's very own lighting crew, Liquid Len and the Lensmen. Hawkwind hit their stride as the biggest freak band in the galaxy, galvanized by the unexpected trajectory of Silver Machine, their second single released in June 1972. Silver machine is a push bike, a silver push bike with a silver bell ding a ling a ling. And um, that's what Robert Calvert wrote the song about. He was on his push bike going through London, ringing his bell, and he just thought, I've got a silver machine. I knew when we were rehearsing it, the place uh, Andy Warhol had hired for a party, he got us to play at it. And I remember thinking then, oh, this could really make it, this could really crack it, you know. It just, for me, was the point 
where Sword Machine became the important track. I just realized something was going to happen off the back of that. I, I just took a I don't know how many copies it sold, a million copies or something like that. So that was the best-selling out record that we ever had. You know, it was available on a commercial level as well. It was in, you know, we were on top of the pops and suddenly, you know, Hawkwind was the flavour of the month, really. So that was quite cool. Dave had the riff and then Bob put the words to it. Um, and that's pretty much how you work with Dave. You didn't really get together like Lennon McCartney and, you know, and. and a couple of guitars. Dave was a very good writer, you know. They was all good songs. Silver Machine brought new pressures to a band that had never had to deal with the business side of music. Well, I mean, hit records always change the dynamic of a group because the guy who wrote the song is suddenly making a lot of more money than everybody else. And then also that there's the guy who sang the song is suddenly in the spotlight. Yeah, they didn't want me to sing it. They tried everybody else singing it except me, because I was a new guy, you know. And then they had to ask me to try it because nobody else could do it. Nobody else could do it behind up. <coughs> and I got it in two takes and it really pissed them off. And then it really pissed them off when it went to number two in the charts and I had my picture on the front of the enemy up on my own. <laughs> Funny as shit. You could hear them seething in the darkness at night. Suddenly we were very successful. Suddenly we had a load of money. I mean, we didn't actually personally have a load of money, but there was a load of money from the record. We did actually get a bit of money. Dick Mick left the band because he didn't like to be in a commercial band, really. It did change, you know, people suddenly saw dollar signs and pound signs. And changed people's attitudes, I think. It probably became less sort of altruistic and less idealistic, really. With Silver Machine, the underground went overground and the sudden influx of hard cash allowed them to mount the ambitious stage show, Space Ritual. It was an amazing show. It was probably one of the best shows ever in rock and roll. In fact, at the height of it, Space Ritual was a great tour, you know. The Space Ritual was a space journey. Now, you can't get more far out than a, a space journey. It was very acidic. It was very psychedelic. That was the whole intention, you know, play on the mind, play on the eyes, play on the ears. And thank God we got it captured on an album, you know. If you turn that up full, put headphones on, take about five tubs of acid, <laughs> fucking, you know, heat up some oil and shit, and project it on the wall, you have some idea of it. It was like relentless. Because we used to play for three hours, you know, without, without stopping. We used to have musical bridges in between the songs. So it, ne it never ended. It must have seemed like it never ended to the poor bastards in the audience. Dave is a, is a master at controlling that particular kind of music. I mean, he really is brilliant at it. He's, he's, he can, he's got a theatrical sense as well as a musical sense. And he always sort of knows when to sort of bring you know, the, bring the band up to, to crescendo and then let it fall away again. With Dave, it was a real rapport, yeah. Because, I mean, we could be facing different ways and we change at the same time during a jam to the same chord, you know. And it was really, I, I knew exactly where he was and he knew exactly where I was. It was a great thing that you don't get that much. I, I've never had it since. I never had it before that either, come to that. Dreamt up by Calvert and planned out by Barney Bubbles. Space Ritual would prove to be one of their most memorable tours. We spent probably about six months uh, somewhere up in Belsize Park putting speakers together. Everybody thinks like, you know, hawking out on the road, oh, everybody's out of it. But, you know, we were actually quite together and quite organised. So would it be the case that the band wasn't as sort of druggy as... Oh no, we were still on drugs. <laughs> we all took drugs. We always had some with us. They weren't all flying on the same fuel. It was the choice of drugs that brought tensions into the band. I personally was into raising people's consciousness, whether with drugs or otherwise. I found in hindsight that other people had different sort of 
beliefs or feelings about it. You know, Demi has sort of quoted saying that um, he wasn't really into the hippy trippy side of Hawkwind. He thought it was all about speed. Well, we did everything except heroin. You know, I mean, heroin's the one that kills you. I've never seen anybody die on anything else. Yeah, I mean, me and Demi were doing everything anyway. The others were a bit snotty about their acid, you know. Oh yes, we only take organic drugs, man. What the fuck are you talking about? LSD isn't organic, you know. Living with Lemmy, well, it was quite difficult in some ways, you know, because he was sort of into his, um, his stimulants, as you might call them, and he'd sort of stay up for a week, and then he'd go to sleep for a week. You know, it's sort of difficult to relate to people like in those sort of circumstances on a normal level, really, you know. Things started to change from like flower power until, you know, I think like the Angry Brigade started coming along and people did start getting into dark, slightly darker drugs, you know, speed and mandrakes and things. Hawkwind toured the space ritual for almost 18 months. The album went gold and around it came a string of classic studio LPs and more lineup changes including the departure of Robert Calvert to make a solo album, and the arrival of classically trained musician Simon House. They phoned up one day and asked me if I'd like to come along and have a jam at uh, Edmonton, the Sunday in Edmonton, because Del Detmar was leaving. And I went along there, and I just hung around backstage and got wrecked, and I was in the band. The next thing that happened was, of course, America was going to happen, and uh, uh, they wanted us over there to tour and so on. Yeah, it was remarkable. A couple of weeks after I joined the band, I was strolling down Sunset Boulevard, um, thinking, yes, this is more like it. Yeah, that was chaos, if you like. I mean, a, an American loony is a much better quality loony than a, an English loony. They go all out, you know, I mean, completely wacko, you know. And they came out of the hills, they came from everywhere. Every gig was virtually a sellout. We got spiked in Cleveland on, by two separate sets of fucking hippies, put um, angel dust in all our drinks, right? So we've had a double dose of it, and I get out on stage and I'm thinking, what the fuck is this? Oh, I hit it and it makes a noise? Good. Hawkwind returned to America in April 1975, but this time, things were about to go seriously wrong. The first episode that I really remember was we pull into a service station, truck stop, to get something to eat. We come out and we can't find Lemmy anywhere. They all went through a meal in this roadhouse and I went out with my camera. And I got whacked over the head and had my camera and nicked. So I didn't have any money hardly on me. And I go back to the roadhouse and they've gone. Left me there. Nice guys, right? Cosmic. searched around the place for the for quite a long time. We couldn't find him, basically. We thought either he's been abducted or he's gone off with, met some friends and gone off with them or something. So I hitchhiked across the entire fucking state of Michigan in the middle of the night, tripping, right? I got picked up by VW microbuses full of bloody hippies, you know, and, and like homosexual truck drivers. It was a really interesting trip one way or the other. And I get there at seven in the morning and it's a convention of cripples. Then there was the episode going into Canada. And Lemmy got busted going into Canada with speed. Two days in jail, handcuffed to a fucking bar. Uh, bailed just in the nick of time as I'm walking into the jail with my prison uniform on my arm. Flown to Toronto, just in time for the sound check. Play. Four o'clock in the morning, get fired. How's that? And during the day, I called the brief in New York, my lawyer in New York, and I said, you know, what's it going to be done for? And they said, nothing. I said, why? It was speed. He said, yeah, but in Canada, speed is a pure food. <laughs> Lemmy's sacking was the first schism to truly rock the spaceship Hawkwind. Well, of course you'd better if you get fired from anything. Should have hidden it better, shouldn't I? You don't think about it though, you know, especially when you're tripping. <laughs> After Lemmy, 
Nick Turner was the next front man to get his marching orders. He was told to bugger off, basically, um, despite repeated warnings of um, playing over other people's solos and singing and all the rest of it. He just would not stop. I was put in a very untenable position where I had certain people saying that unless I left, they were going to leave. So I sort of stepped down, basically. I sort of thought, you know, I, I bowed out gracefully, really. It was just a complete fuck-up. You know, they, they were just about to make it in America. They were just about to start having a name for themselves, and they blew it completely. For one thing, they fired me, and I was the driver behind that band. I drove it, you know. And then they fired everybody who, who was good in the band. They fired Nick, and, like, Stacia left. Stacia got married and moved to Germany. Lemmy formed Motorhead. And Nick went to record flute music in the Great Pyramid. With Lemmy and Turner gone, Robert Calvert returned as the bipolar heart of the band to power Hawkwind through some turbulent times ahead. I mean, he's, a, he's a genius. His, his lyrics are just wonderful, fantastic. Einstein was not a handsome fellow. Nobody ever called him out. He would get over overstretched and start losing it. He was prone to uh, get uh, almost violent sometimes, and he also had a, a penchant for guns and swords. I remember that he had a machine gun firing blanks at, at one gig. He would go into a complete fantasy world from time to time. Uh, his poetry would actually take him down different paths and he would become another character. <laughs> uh, and he believed in the characters he wrote about. I think that made him rather interesting. Calvert's obsession with guns and grenades goes back to Urban Gorilla, the single released as a follow-up to Silver Machine in 1973. I heard Urban Gorilla and I just said, that's the next track, it's fantastic, let's go for it. And uh, we put it out and then the IRA blew up Baker Street. I heard you singing about, I'm an Urban Gorilla, I got bombs in my cellar, you know. We put out a press release that in view of what had happened, uh, we should withdraw the record. So we withdrew the record. For some, idealism had turned into direct action. And at the height of the bader meinhof terror campaign in the late 70s, Calvert's obsession with revolutionary movements came to a head over the course of a fateful European tour. On the last French tour, where none of the other guys in the band would actually spend any moment with him. And every night he spent the whole night in the lavatory building pyramids out of wet tissue paper. And he was reading this terrorist propaganda out loud in the lavatory through it in the hotel room night after night. I remember once he was banging on my door about seven o'clock in the morning demanding some sleeping pills. And, uh, uh, he came into my room and he started banging his head on the wardrobe and I think he, uh, he might even have pinned me up against the wall or something. Then he'd also been off and bought a couple of hand grenades and a couple of handguns. Well, it was obvious that he was, wasn't in his right mind. It started to get really serious. Bob had gone right out on a limb and believed that the whole of the head of every terrorist organization and guerrilla movement around the world had arrived at the gig in Paris and were all in the mosh pit in front of the stage. So when the show finished, he invited all of them backstage into the dressing room. We couldn't go on. We had the secret meeting in, in somebody's room and it, it was literally a plan to escape from the hotel without Bob seeing us. They were all up very early the following morning. I went down to breakfast and said, what's going on? They said, we're leaving. There were three more gigs of the tour, but we can't handle it anymore. We've had enough. He's, he needs help, but we can't deal with it. You'll have to deal with it yourself. 
got the car, got all the stuff in the car and pulled out into the traffic. Bob came down just as they were running out the hotel and he came down in his leather jodhpurs and his sword and his leather coat and they ran and they started driving off in the traffic with Bob running over the top, over the roof of the car with his sword to kill them. And he was running after us. I was like, oh no, he's gonna catch us. And he did, he did catch up with us. He was trying to open the car doors, this look on his face. It was, it was awful. I had to empty his bags of all this war propaganda, all the, uh, yeah, removed two guns and two grenades and a couple of swords and blades. And we went to Charles de Gaulle and he was convinced that they were trying to get us there. And he said they're they gassing us through the air conditioning. They're gassing us, they're gonna gas us. He was living out the urban guerrilla in him. He was a, a street fighting man. He said, forget the Rolling Stones, they were pussies, they were, I'm the real thing. But really, he was so sweet. Calvert got married three weeks later and was reconciled with the band as their 1977 album, Quark, Strangeness and Charm, reached a new generation of listeners. My favourite period of Hawkins music would be undoubtedly uh, the end of the 70s or mid to end of the 70s when, uh, <laughs> ironically, Hawkins had pretty much abandoned the sort of heavy riffing that characterised their sound from the sort of very start of the, uh, of the 70s, which uh, all the acid rockers love best of all. Um, and it was a period that sort of preempted punk rock, I suppose. In the days of the underground. As the ambassadors of stoner rock in England in the early 70s, it was inevitable that the, the young kids that were going to go on to become punk musicians would come, you know, would, would find themselves at a Hawkwind concert, taking drugs and probably quite enjoying the experience. And in a way, Hawkwind was a proto-punk punk group like The Clash. I mean, in that, in that all, of the, all of the lyrics tended to be urban lyrics or, or lyrics that, that were, were kind of gritty in that same way not, and, and were attacking in that same way. When Johnny Rotten came to you know to, to, to say everything was rubbish, it was so everything was rubbish except Hawkwind. The punch were more of a revolution than we were really, because we were a revolution from below, you know, whereas the punch were a revolution from within. But I think we had the better drugs, because the punks all ended up on smack, you know, which killed them, you know. One of those young punks, Ron Tree, would go on to join Hawkwind as a vocalist in the 90s. I basically watched punk rock and realised anyone can do it and then started to see all these crap punk bands doing really well. Auckland, when, when I was a punk at, when I was 17, Auckland, the, the word didn't mean a great deal to me. But I went and checked them out and they were, they were great, you know. They had an incredible light show and it was visually stunning at the time, you know. Um, so I kept following up, kept going to see them. Whenever they played, I'd just go check them out. What's that? Ten pound note? The punk generation had swelled the ranks of the free festival scene into a nomadic movement numbering in the tens of thousands, reaching its height at the Stonehenge Free Festival. It was total chaos. Uh, there were some very big, very heavy, very threatening people uh, moving around, Hills Angels hassling you if you took a photograph uh, of their motorbike without asking permission. A real feeling of lawlessness, um, an enormous presence of drugs uh, right in your face. I mean, everyone's standing around with signs saying, here we sell OSD, uh, lines of cocaine, hot knives, all this kind of stuff going around. 
Uh, and, and just like unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. And in the midst of all of this, everyone's waiting for Hawkwind. And uh, Hawkwind played uh, at about God, five in the morning, I should think. By the end of the 70s, what had been a fellowship was now under the control of one man. Calvert had gone, along with all the original members bar Dave Brock, who would lead from the front from now on. Inviting Hugh Lloyd Langton back on board as part of a new lineup, which briefly included legendary drummer Ginger Baker, who lasted an album and tour before getting sacked. And incredibly enough, Turner returned for a two-year stint in the early 80s. It wouldn't take a genius to see trouble ahead. Quite honestly, I needed the money. Um, I was in a band called Inner City Unit, which was breaking up because of drugs problems, you know, within the band. First worrying sign was... <laughs> it was... He, he, he'd, he'd shaved his head. Oh, my God. And he had... He looked like a unicorn. He did. He had a, a, a long, a long... Horn, but then came his grand entrance in a, a stocking <laughs> suit, body, body stocking suit, you know, all painted in psychedelic colours uh, on roller skates. <laughs> looked fantastic, you know, because I just sort of moved my legs around so that it didn't appear that I was moving my legs and I seemed to be just gliding around the stage playing my saxophone. <laughs> Absolutely no subtlety at all. Zaha! But it carried on like that for the whole flipping gig, you know, like honking it's away. So didn't go down well. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think so, you so, might so. have done with the audience. <laughs> Eventually I came on stage being carried in a coffin um, by some of the road crew. I'd be put down and then I'd come out of the coffin in this outfit that was all UV and I just used to sort of whiz around the stage on roller skates looking like I was on ice. And it wasn't long before he whizzed straight off it again. We were going to have this meeting and I didn't bother to go to the meeting because I thought I didn't need to. And um, then I was phoned up to say, um, oh we had the meeting without you. And, and, you're, and we've sacked you from the band. And I thought, oh, thanks. <laughs> Over the next two decades, Brock led Hawkwind through alliances with metal, trance and rave, releasing studio albums alongside numerous live sets, and sustaining the band's legacy on the road with a core lineup revolving around Brock and the rhythm section of Richard Chadwick and Alan Davey that has remained stable to this day. But as the millennium approached, so did their 30th anniversary. And it was Doug Smith who suggested a one-off reunion gig. But reuniting the band with its past created inevitable discord. The idea had come from me to say, why don't we get everybody together for an anniversary gig and call it the orchestra? We did a survey. We asked all the fans to vote their favorite tracks they would like to hear the orchestra play. And then it ended up in a fight. <laughs> with the orchestra, well, I did that for the fans, really. I was involved with it for the fans. I mean, I'm the sort of person who, who do things if I can. If I can do it, I will. Yeah, that was a fucking screw-up, Susie. They got Dick Mick in from Morocco and Del in from Canada. And then they went on stage and their shit wasn't plugged in. <laughs> a wonderful example of Hawkwind, yeah. There were people who took their savings from their life. There were people who were in wheelchairs that came from America to see Nick and Dave back on stage together again. So important that those original members were there. It was all a bit very strange. It was nice to see some faces. I hadn't seen Dick Mc for ages or Lemmy. It was nice to see quite a lot of people. Or Dell, I hadn't seen Dell for years. Have you been with the band for a while? Or you uh, no, I haven't been with the band for 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. So how many years have you had? 26 since I played with the band. He doesn't look a day old. And I don't. Dave was a bit strange. I, I couldn't shake his hand, I'm afraid. But we talked, you know, briefly. I mean, they brought on fucking Sam Fox to sing Master of the Universe. You know, I mean, that's, that's not only dumb, 
It's like a mockery of the song, and like it's Nick's number. You know, it was always Nicky's number. You can't replace that guy. And he was on stage, you know. Orchestra ended in litigation over how the money was to be divided, and the schism between some ex members and the current lineup turned into a full scale court battle when Turner decided to put together his own group made up of former members. The band Ex Hawkwind was a band that, um, that I got together with all ex members of Hawkwind, and I thought, well, Ex Hawkwind is a sort of an apt title, so I can't say anything wrong with that because they're all ex-members of Hawkwind. But um, unbeknown to me, and unbeknown to most other people, David actually trademarked the name of Hawkwind. He put an injunction on me, claiming damages from me because of infringement of his trademark. So I ended up in court and um, having to pay damages. It cost us thousands and thousands, and we're all skin hippies, so forget it. <laughs> We uh, just had to change the name to Space Ritual. I took Nick's part in that, that rift. Um, I sort of lost my friendship with Dave as a result of it. But um, I don't think that, I don't think either of them s seriously have broken faith with how they started. I do think that, that Nick was the spirit of the band, but Dave was the, was the kind of the backbone of the band, without any doubt. I find it quite amusing on the sidelines, but what can you do? You know, it's, it's only it's only music. We're all going to die. <laughs> what I can't understand is the best years of their life were when they were together and successful and having fantastic fun and having great times and doing things that were crazy. You don't grow up and have all those stories and then just swish it away. The experiences they had were just fantastic. And they should all look back on it with love and think of these golden moments of their lives because they ain't got golden moments anymore. Hawkwind are still working outside the parameters of the music business, mounting regular tours and hosting their own festival, the Hawkfest, and seeing Hawkwind's influence seep through succeeding generations of stoners and ravers. I always said that Hawkwind were the Pink Floyd with guts. And I think the dance community basically have a lot, owe a lot to Hawkwind. Hawkwind was playing music that you could dance to. People were always dancing to Hawkwind. It was very rhythmic. It was dum 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 dum, you know, heartbeat all the time. I think any band that's been playing for 30 plus years still producing innovative material uh, that has had so much influence in so many different spheres demands respect. I think the name of Hawkwind will live forever. Hawkwind's legacy will actually increase in, in, in impact rather than decrease because it did hold the faith. I mean, it held, held the faith in many ways better than the Sex Pistols held the faith. If that's what you value. What's the legacy of Auckland? Probably get as wrecked as possible and you can still play your instrument, I think. Or just escape, you know, which all good music is. You know, escape from the shit world that you're stuck in, you know. Because uh, all good music is a complete escape, especially classical music, you know. People go to a concert and spend the whole thing with their eyes closed, you know, and visions, you know, and that's exactly what Auckland was, you know. A bit more violent than Brahms, you know, but I mean, it's pretty good. There's an unscheduled treat next, Hawkwind's Silver Machine.